Special thanks to our headlining sponsors, Extinet, Zenwave, and Solid. So we're ready for our last session. For those of you who may join us late, my name is Jeff Mucci. I'm the CEO and Head of Industry Insights for Art Media. We're publishers of RCR Wireless News, Enterprise IoT Insights, and today we're launching in-building technology. We've had a, a, a series of presentations all designed around one thing, and that's uh, what I like to call closing the technology gap between technology sellers and technology buyers. And in the case of technology buyers, it can be a building owner, but it also could be an enterprise or a corporate real estate executive who's responsible for leasing or owning space in a high-rise building, in a hospital, but it also could be in a manufacturing facility. So our last panel, we're gonna be talking about how in-building tech drives uh, return on investment. We've got Ron Zimmer, who's CEO of CABA, which is the Continental Building, Continental Automation, Automated Buildings Association. That's a tongue twister. Um, Billy Rowland, who's chief engineer for this building, Bank of America Tower and Plaza, and Tim Dans, who came in from California, who's the chief engineer of 345 Cal uh, California. Um, the facility we're in now is, I think, 1.8 million square feet, roughly yes, speaking? Yes, absolutely. And then uh, you're building 345 California? We're, we're about a million. About a million square feet. Both those systems have what has been termed in this, uh, this show today, good bones. I heard that Great term. Bones. It's got good bones and it's got glass. And so glass is a, a hot topic, and, uh, but in the context of one way to future-proof your building today or your facility is to invest in fiber, the conduit, the plumbing that will allow all these applications to flow. That includes um, fiber to your customers. That includes connectivity and coverage in your building, building automation systems, and for those who missed it, we just had a wonderful panel on public safety um, that included the um, communication specialist, Alan uh, uh, Kelly from the city of uh, uh, Dallas, uh, Ken Rabin, thank you very, uh, that was a great job, Ken. And then finally, we had John Foley from the Safer Building Coalition. I invite you to go back and listen to that presentation because uh, one of the statistics was one minute of improved response time would save 10,000 lives a year. Did I get that right? Did I get that right? I think I got that right. So next time you're having a heart attack or not feeling well, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that your building has good bones and glass. So the question I wanna open up with today is really targeted to um, uh, Billy and Tim, and, and this is hard to quantify, and I'm gonna put you on the spot, and it's gonna be uncomfortable, but um, <laughs> um, it's, it's not as bad as going to, you know, Turn to 50, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> Been there. <laughs> uh, what role do building engineers play in helping building owners drive return on investment in building systems or net operating income to the bottom line? I'll jump in. Um, I, I can think of many ways that engineers equipped with the uh, proper technology don't speak to NOI. Um, I, and again, I bring the word speed back into the discussion. Um, with the tech that we've uh, leveraged and, and put in place, uh, not only are we preemptively uh, troubleshooting an issue, um, we're much more quick to diagnose it and respond to it. Um, uh, Billy just touched on uh, the the. the the general topic of energy management, where we're, uh, we're managing large um, amounts of power to power the systems that make the building go, uh, in uh, using tech and, and some good common sense in, uh, in making reductions to utility spend, uh, certainly speak to NOI. And then there's some uh, esoteric um, you know, values that, yes, are hard to quantify, but tenant satisfaction, which speaks to tenant retention, um, and the technologies we've put in place that you know, appear to me to have given our tenant base this sort of uh, sense of, uh, you know, they, they feel that they're, uh, We've got eyes on um, on on their space and and um, uh, their you know, which speaks to their productivity. But uh, 
you know, this sense that, hey, these guys, uh, this team has their eyes on it um, and they can respond quicker. Often, uh, technologies uh, can translate to the, the challenge of force reduction. Uh, the way I look at, at, uh, at that relative to NOI is if we can reduce the amount of time it takes to do A, B, or C, we can then take that labor and repurpose it to uh, other, uh, other targets that bring value and add value. And so I think, um, you know, it, there, there aren't too many ways that, that engineers do not uh, translate to the bottom line. Billy? So what I would add to that is safe, comfortable work environment. Keep your tenants, keep them happy. But I'll also say with the system that we're installing today and using the fiber backbone, which we weren't able to do before uh, or see before, is your electrical usage. I can see my electrical usage at every single air handler in the building. If I make a temperature change, I can see if that's a benefit for us or does it hurt the tenant and how much does that weigh to the electrical usage today? Being called on by Encore to reduce electrical costs for certain hours of the day. You know, turning off an elevator, I can turn those elevators off and I can see what that cost is or that savings is for us. And does it benefit us and the tenants and the traffic at that time to implement that in order for, to get everybody in and out of the building the way they should be able to flow? You know, before we move on, Ron, Ron's going to give a presentation on... Um, uh, building automation systems and, and, and the impact they can have on buildings. But we just had a great discussion on public safety, and I am kind of curious how you're, uh, you're in California, Bill, you're here in, 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 Dal uh, in Dallas. How, do you, how, do you, how are you looking, how are building owners and engineers looking at this uh, National Fire Safety Code? You know, we were just talking offline a little bit, um, and, and, you know, there are some, I guess, dichotomies in a sense that, uh, there, you know, you look at the San Francisco Bay Area and, and sort of, uh, you know, tech, tech center and all of this, and, and yet I have found, and this is true, I think, in, in most, if not all, cities, uh, where, uh, you know, the, the codes are lagging, um, and there are so many layers uh, that, that uh, AHJs have to, to navigate uh, in order to... Um, uh, you know, write new additions to existing codes, the, the cost impacts and, and the, uh, you know, the uh, advocates for building owners that are trying to control costs, you know, a, a, a code mandate can have, you know, an incredible monetary impact. Uh, and so I, I've observed over the years that uh, they're, they're, in my mind, they're not sometimes as quick as you'd like to be or, or the, the public uh, would like it to be with regard to creating a safe environment. Um, and so it, it's, uh, it, again, there's this sort of uh, tug of war that's going on. And um, uh, it's, it's uh, you know, it, it it's always seems to be lagging uh, based on what is available today and what we know today that will work um, and when it actually gets implemented. And I'll go to the panel that sat up here and talked about your cell phone signal while you're up here walking around. You have to realize this is the second highest place in North Texas. So we bounce your signals right here off the roof. You communicate from here out there. You don't communicate straight up and down with your cell phone signals. So that's why the signal here and that's why it's being addressed in our 2019 budget. We're gonna do a DOS system. We're gonna to try to make that communication better. Where do you tie that system? Do you tie it to your generator system? How long does that last in an emergency? Those are things that we're, we are in the conversation with Extinet and several other companies talking about how do we set it up to be the most failed proof as possible. It's never going to be in a position where it's not going to fail. It's, at some point it will. 
we have a struggle throughout the building after about floor 40, 42, that if you do not install Wi-Fi calling or a DOS system on your own, and ownership is dedicated to spending the $1 million or whatever it's going to cost to do it, have it here in place, ready to go, back to, tied to that fiber network. Without that network, it does not happen. Good. Thank you for that feedback. Uh, Ron, I'm going to let you talk a little bit about how the automated systems drive NOI. So sure. I'll turn over the clicker to you. Thank you so much. You bet. Thank you. So further to what I said yeah, earlier. You'll click there and it'll. Oh, here we go. There. So further to what uh, I said uh, in the first session, um, I'm going to try over the next 10 minutes to share with you some of the insights that we have. Again, CABA is an industry association. We work uh, strictly on uh, intelligent buildings, connected home technologies uh, for all buildings, industrial as well. And so as an organization, we definitely want to, how can I make it move here? It's just, if I do this, will it, uh, just hit this. yeah, there you, go. there you go, all right. And so, so basically, um, I want to say that uh, our association as an industry uh, trade association is about 30 years old. We're governed by a very prestigious board of directors uh, made up of a very wide, uh, varying body of companies, organizations that are involved in this particular industry. And again, it's been shared by many other speakers that uh, when we think of technology and how it is coming together, uh, there was a great slide earlier by one of the speakers showing that today there's so many different systems within buildings that do tie together. Um, historically, you know, started with uh, obviously HVAC systems, heating, ventilation, air conditioning. So you had a motion detector. It got tied into your lighting system. Today, there's over 300 different technologies, and that's probably a, a, a even out of date in terms of what can be tied together and then in that integrated system be part of uh, a, 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 an ability for that owner, operator, manager, uh, the occupant to really take advantage of what this technology can do for them. So this I talked about earlier in terms of how we've moved from very archaic system, pneumatic systems, all the way up as we now enter in this world of uh, IoT, IoT for everything, and data, data analytics, uh, moving to cloud tech, use of cloud technology, blade technology, where we're actually doing some of that data analytics uh, literally by the building, uh, and artificial intelligence. We're just starting on that, that big movement, which will be transformative to our industry, of artificial intelligence, robotics. There are so many new technologies are coming at us uh, because there are some great engineers in China, Europe, North America, Silicon Valley, and Texas. Uh, Austin, the new Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that bad to say Austin and Dallas? I'm not sure. <laughs> Dallas is one of the top tech uh, cities in the world. So when you look at how we've now transformed moving to I talked about the open standard bodies and the open standards getting away from the, the traditional, even uh, archaic uh, standards that were proprietary, where companies tried to control the campus, the university campus, university, by their own standards and saying, who are you going to call if there's an issue? And check your warrant. Will your warranty be voided if you use somebody else's system? And the poor little facility manager goes, ah, my job. My pay grade isn't that high. I, I don't need to have that problem. So as we move to the internet and IP protocols, what is happening, of course, is the cost, the adoption of technology is going up. Absolutely. The cost of technology is going down. And that's an amazing factor, which now allows us to have literally all the technology, literally, that you could ever want is here today. Now, the question is, is it being utilized in the built sector? And the short answer is absolutely not. There are some clear exceptions in this room, in fact. Uh, the two gentlemen right beside me absolutely embrace it. Some of the great companies like 
Extinet and Zinwave uh, are great members of CABA. So if you think about where we're going and how this is changing this uh, evolution or revolution in the industry is that we have moved from just simply connecting devices and collecting data to actually analyzing that data to taking advantage of data, monetizing it in a way that we actually still provide privacy. We still try to ensure that there's security, cybersecurity. That's a whole that's a whole panel onto itself. Uh, <laughs> but it's an important one that we have to understand because it's actually one of the impediments of adoption is concern over cybersecurity. And and rightfully so. To the point that we're going to get to now, uh, the world of, of artificial intelligence. And it's not just predictive analytics. It's not just being able to predict like a nest to say, I know what my temperature, what your temperature, what your likes are as an occupant of your house. It's actually being able to now make decisions based on what other machines are telling it based on past performance. So we're moving beyond the ability to, say, predictive um, maintenance, for example. We have a chiller that the motor is not working efficiently. And maybe somebody didn't pick up on that. Oh, we could fix that. And actually fix it before you know, it, it shuts down and before you have an issue in a hospital where you now have uh, an energy issue. So ultimately, that's where we're going, and we're going very fast. So a lot of companies are moving very rapidly, uh, not the least of which IBM, for example, with Watson, they're actually looking very diligently at how do they monetize Watson to take advantage of providing that information, uh, that, that uh, artificial intelligence, to potentially work with the targeted healthcare, to prevent, potentially cure certain cancers because they're, they're aggregating information. Uh, they spoke in Yinchuan, China, when I was there speaking at a Smart Cities conference, and the gentleman from Cork, Ireland, their, their massive lab, put it in, layman, in just layman's terms of how this is coming so quickly. And I asked him after, I said, now, will IBM own that data? And he said, no, we don't want to own the data. And maybe rightly so, they don't want to be in competition with the people they want to work with. But that data is inside Watson. That data is just congregating. Two other great companies, Google, Amazon, who've been masters at, at collecting data. Why do you think in the home market they are moving so rapidly and those two gorillas are fighting it out and moving in step with each other? Amazon had the lead. Google, in the last quarter, actually outsold them in their home. So, and they'll be one of the first technologies moving from the home, connected home, to the large center, to the, to the commercial sector. Amazon's created a whole division of, of being able to take advantage of that. Why? Because we're going to get to our, in our homes. How many here have Amazon, uh, either Amazon, Google, uh, Microsoft, or, or Siri, Apple? How many have that in your homes? Actually, 23% of all U.S. households have a smart speaker currently. Yet home is only, uh, is only uh, number th three or four. Actually, there's music, there's asking questions, there's shopping before actually home services. But Amazon's actually created a whole division because we're going to say we could change our temperature by talking to that speaker. We could turn the lights down, off, which is easily done now, and we're going to get to our office and we're going to say, I want to change the temperature. Where's the thermostat? I can't even find a thermostat. Or you might find one and it's not really working. It's just there for your convenience to fool around with. <laughs> it's true. Anyway, so, so that's one of the technologies coming to the commercial sector, voice recognition. Another big mover is sensors. Sensors have come down in price so much that it's incredible. So now we can have sensors everywhere. We can put sensors on this table, on your chair, on any device. Well, I was at a conference that did, did printable electronics, uh, printable electronics. So imagine this, printing sensors with photovoltaic material that could get enough power off ambient lighting in an office building to power that sensor. No more batteries. It's incredible. So now we could literally put sensors everywhere. Can you imagine like to be able to control your inventory? Where are those devices, those machinery, that person? Oh, that's nice. We won't go that far. 
well, there are. There are chips now that are actually are being offered. There's a company in Wisconsin that did uh, chip, a chip for their uh, staff, and they had 41 that took advantage of opt-in to get rid of uh, 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 swipe cards and access controls. How big is the market? It's huge. So the control, the whole technology, when you look at where you can actually generate revenue and where is the biggest is still lighting, coming back to the ROI, a lot of builders and developers say, if I can't get a two-year payback, I'm not doing it. I'm not investing. I'm staying with a standalone system. You know what? The cheapest, we'll just do the RFP and we'll buy the cheap, lowest cost. That's the way we do it. Not recognizing life cycle costing can actually great, generate huge value. And we were talking about before the session started, energy management. What if the payback is four years? Well, I'm not putting it in. Yet energy costs are likely going to rise. And can you imagine after the payback forever and ever, or at least all that technology will likely be around 10 to 15 years. So there's a lot of money to be made, both in terms of the companies that supply the products and services, your utilities, your uh, telcos, your cable codes, uh, OEMs, the hardware, software, but the end user, the builder and developer has so many opportunities to monetize. That's why we're doing a, a we did a, a research project on life cycle costing, and we're actually, to show that, to, we gave it away, and you could have it if you wish from our, from CABA, but we're also now doing one on monetization. We're saying you can monetize your uh, your uh, building in a way that you probably didn't understand. And a good example is this building and how I heard one on the tour. That's why I was late. I was on that great tour and how you've been able to monetize a very small square foot. Uh, square, uh, number, uh, the square footage is not very large and the amount of revenue it's generated is huge. So when you look at, at the future, where this trend of IoT and commercial buildings it is phenomenal. In fact, you can't see this, but I think we're gonna share the slides with everybody. But just to give you an example, in 2018, we're right around 20, just over 20, under 25, 25 billion uh, devices. It's going to over 80 billion, and they feel that's even very conservative by the year 2025. So whether we like it or not, we are gonna be very connected. And in the building, in the old days, it was just the building systems were connected. Now we're gonna be connected to devices, our smart devices, our homes to our offices. We're gonna be connected with connected cars, our wearables. All of, these, all of these things will be connected and will be part of this ecosystem. And if you want to take advantage of it as a builder developer, that's a huge opportunity, a huge way to differentiate and to monetize a building in a way you never thought. It's not just to be able to have the square footage, it's like you get high quality square footage. And if you've ever seen uh, the Edge Building in uh, Amsterdam, look at the video, go uh, on YouTube and ask for, search for the Edge Building. The most intelligent building, the most sustainable building, highest Bream score ever. Uh, Bream is like lead in, in the UK and, and Europe. And Oh, by the way, it's got 30% less square footage than the average building. It's, the Del it's a Deloitte building now, constructed by a company. 30% 30% less. Can you imagine all the buildings in North America? If we took 30% of it away, we didn't really need it. Particularly now with technology, we have hoteling and, and uh, teleworking. But here's the key thing. If I leave you with nothing today, this uh, slide, we did a, a, and we're doing a project on productivity. So productivity is all about the fact that we waste a lot of our staff and employee time. And like I said earlier, our most valuable asset in a building is the people, the employees, the customers, the people who utilize the building. We are in the building most of the time per year, per day, per week. And if you look at actually a building, a typical commercial building, this is actually from Harvard. Joseph Allen spoke at uh, Realcom on our panel. He's done great research on cognitive functioning, and uh, he's on to his third different uh, project now that's going to be worldwide. But he showed so clearly that, and we've, you've heard about the 1990 uh, rule, 90% 
of the cost in a building, in this building, 90% on average, is the people. You mentioned the lawyers, high price, Google. They actually believe it's much higher in Silicon Valley because of the high tech. So what, what, what about the operating costs and the 10%? Energy is actually 1%. So what do we focus on in our industry? Got to get that energy bill down. Got to make our building more productive, more functional, more safe, which is all good. And we kind of forget about the big ticket item, the big piece of steak. It's the people. So we're trying to prove in CABA, beyond a shadow of a doubt, using a major research project, we have actually first phase, which has been done, and we'll give it away to anybody that wants it. But the 90% is we're gonna prove that you can actually have greater value if you look at your employees and consider them on the wellness side. Consider the fact that if you made them more productive, not to squeeze more work out of your employee. Good example, uh, Ryan's Mortimer from Microsoft is on our board of directors and he said, in their own company, how much time is wasted to find a parking spot in their campus? How much time is wasted to, to find an elevator that actually isn't working? Well, maybe it's been shut off because you've tried to save some energy. But maybe there is the fact that you get to, to a meeting, high-priced talent at Microsoft, and you wait 15 minutes because some executive who's from a different building or a different uh, campus can't find the building, can't find the, you know, can't find the parking spot. Now it's late. So now you've got 15 minutes of these high-priced talent just waiting. Oh, wait a minute. Everybody's there, and now the technology doesn't work can't get the PowerPoints, can't get synced up. So imagine if you had the technology and it's there today to make that, make that productivity much more positive. We know for a shadow of a doubt, if you get the air quality just right, the temperature just right, the lighting, get rid of all the mold, the, the dust, the pollens, the NOx that's in the, in the building. Allergies are rampant now. So if we can do that, we know for a fact, but we will want to prove this, the employees will be much happier. They'll have lower sick days. They will have lower absenteeism. They'll have less complaints to the facility managers. And why wouldn't you do that if you are an employer? This is how you can show your employees that we care about you. And you should. Actually, coming back to the edge building, Deloitte actually said, now in a year and a half of existence, they are the number one Deloitte building in all of Europe. They have offices in every big city in Europe, every capital, they actually found that it's the number one retention for, employ for employees with Deloitte. If they do have openings, it's the number one place that Deloitte employees from other centers want to go to. Consider this. What's your most valuable asset? Your people. Your, people, your lawyers, your accountants. You don't want to lose them. You want to actually attract the best and brightest, the millennials. So here's an added value that you can get with technology. And again, technology is just one of the things. I must be getting to the end here. Yep. So very quickly, there is a lot of things that uh, buildings will, will change, will continue to change. And technology is just one piece of that. But you can add a great deal of value to your building to differentiate yourself, to, to create a better bottom line, to, to have an attractive building for your employees and actually be viewed as we didn't stick more people into cubicles and then they all have to have the same temperature. So renewables, California is a great example. I mean, California is so moving so quickly as, we, as was said earlier in terms of energy, uh, the goals that they have set. Uh, now the, the law is on, on new home construction. They must put uh, photovoltaic. So they're moving very rapidly. Others will follow. And a building literally could be an energy creator. Not just zero net energy, which we did a study and I could show you that. It's free. So basically, it actually could be an energy producer. Can you imagine, again, what that would do to our utility world if we had every building being a net energy energy producer, not just zero than energy. And finally, we're, we're, we look at the future and what is the future? Smart cities. Uh, when you see the smart city phenomena and how many major centers and, my, and not large cities who are saying we should be a smart city and why aren't we? And there are some great examples. I, I, I talked about Austin, Dallas, uh, Palo Alto, Barcelona, 
uh, Vancouver. Uh, Yinshuan is the, is the prototype city. It's their lab. A million people. Imagine in China. Imagine the U.S. You took a city of a million people and said, that's our, that's our lab. We're going to just do all the testing there. And when we're done with the testing and it works, we're going to roll it out to 400 other cities. And guess what? The mayors love it because they love their jobs as mayors. And only in China could you do that. You would not see that in North America or Europe. No, we create our technology and then we'll license it or we'll sell it. But in any case, that's the way it's done in China. But there's a movement right around the world, and I've spoken at talking about smart buildings. Because I say to people, if you say you have a smart city and your fire stations, your police stations, your city hall, your public works, your transit buildings, if they are not smart, could you really call yourself a smart city? You might have smart street lighting, which is important. So ultimately, that's a growth opportunity that's happening over, and there's billions of dollars that are being applied because the mayors, the elected officials, and the administrators want their city to be smart because it's positive, it's very strong for economic development, for all kinds of gains for the city. And buildings have, will be a key part of that. So we have a ton of free research in, in CABA on our public library. And so basically, uh, take advantage of all our free research. Uh, you can see me after, and I'll certainly, uh, if you give me your card, I will we'll send you a lot of free research that we have that, uh, that we give away, some we sell. And again, uh, it's been a pleasure because I always learn more at these events. Uh, Jeff, con congratulations. We talked about education learning. And Thank you. you provide these forums to do that. Thank you. David Clicker. Thank you, Ron. So we're going we're to wrap up with a few questions. I want to try, try to connect the dots here. And uh, I opened up by talking about our role is in, in closing the technology divide between tenants and landlords. And, um, and we've talked about fiber. We've talked about wireless. We've talked about public safety. We've talked about building automation systems. And so I want to get back to um, the role of the engineer and, and, and that payback. Um, Someone said you had to have a two-year payback. Um, that's pretty tight. But um, True. one of my friends who works for a lighting company, Cree Lighting, he said, Jeff, and he moved from Austin to North Carolina to go to work for a lighting company. I, and I called him up and I said, why on earth did you go to work for a lighting company? And he told me a little bit about Cree, which is a very innovative lighting company. They make a great light fixture. Yeah. So <laughs> what he said, and it really, the, 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 the light went off for me, but... Um, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> that was crazy. Nope. No <laughs> he said the LED lighting um, is the pack mule in terms of if a building is going to put in LED lighting, you're going to put in good bones. You're going to put in the glass. So I would just maybe ask Billy and, and Tim, have you experienced putting in an LED system or have some of your friends put in LED system and use that to justify a structured fiber system? Well, I will jump in and say that you can no longer do any improvement, any permitted improvement, and I'm sure this is the case in, in many cities, but certainly in San Francisco or California with the energy code, it, it's 100% LED now. Yeah. Uh, the technology has obviously arrived, um, never mind evolved, and, um, and so it, it's... it's there, there is no longer compact fluorescent as far as new, new, new development, new uh, improvement. Um, incandescent is the dinosaur, um, compact fluorescent, it's, um, it's LED, the color rendering, dimming capability, um, but it is, it is a, it probably the biggest component to the California Energy Code, I think, right now. So every renovation, every redevelopment, and are, you, are the folks tying it back into a fiber system? Um, yes, they are. Well, the, the advanced, and we talked about, uh, touched on Cree, there's Wattstopper, Lutron, uh, these advanced uh, lighting control systems. And the codes are now such that um, the building owner shall build in the capability. Um, and it's, it's funny, with each iteration, they creep up on these um, where it's, you, you shall, you shall um, prepare for the next iteration, iteration um, w such that it will become a hard and fast mandate, such that the 10% of the lighting in your space must be shed during a curtailment event. 
And so it ha it and and that is one of the uh, instigators for our fiber implementation was to prepare for those integrations and code, uh, you know, requirements. Got it. I, w I was. I'll just uh, jump in that. Uh, so I was just here in Dallas last week on a major lighting conference and uh, sharing some research and uh, showed a chart that by 2025 incandescents are basically gone, gone. Like, like yeah. say, they will be like they'll be historic, PCs. like beta and VHS. <laughs> anyway, so so the other part, but the so LEDs is just going is just continuing, but the good part, which is now part of L, it's not just LEDs and the fantastic longevity and durability, which we didn't have at the start. But now, there's so much more that they can do with the lighting. So you can put sensors in it. You can put uh, your wireless, and it's mesh networks. So you can put uh, a Wi-Fi. You can put uh, cameras in them. So the value add, there's data sensors into it. Uh, uh, I don't know if everybody knows, but Siemens, uh, which is on our board, they just bought three companies. They bought Enlighted. Now they're back in the lighting business. Remember, they sold off. Um, who did they just? They sold Osram. off. Yeah, Osram. Osram. And uh, and now they they got they have been lighted. They bought J two Innovations and they just bought Comfy. So they are just doubling down and saying we want to be one of the leaders in intelligence. Because lighting is an enabling technology. And that and the lighted is uh, according to a member of CABA. We lose members that way through mergers and acquisitions. But they actually, uh, for example, we'll go in the shopping mall. So now you've got this great advantage of lighting controls, but actually you could, the shopping mall people would say, can you, can you count people? And they go, well, we can. That's fantastic for a shopping mall to be able to know traffic. You know, how much traffic anytime per day, per day, per week, and uh, to show clients or existing tenants, future tenants, to show traffic. So this is where the lighting world is changing and coming back to that massive amount of data. How many here have heard of Li-Fi? Li-Fi, all right? It's Li-Fi, 100 times faster than Wi-Fi. Except it won't go through walls, of course, because it has to, to, to follow the light. So when you think of that, that data that's gonna be flowing, coming back to collecting data, utilizing data, and that's where lighting is gonna change. The other part that's changing is the whole paradigm of Reoccurring revenue for lighting companies is gone. It was changing the bulbs. And now the bulbs last for a long time. So that's why we're seeing now lighting as a service coming in. Mm -hmm. And so lighting, so Philips just announced in Europe with a major investor uh, to, uh, to launch one of their lighting as a service. Eaton was sitting at, right beside me, he said, we've been doing it for two years. So lighting as a service, so you come back to ESCOs, same, same principle. And so these are new, new things that are coming at the builds and develops in a good way. I believe yep. it's a positive way. Hey, Billy, I love your thoughts on LED. So to answer your question, does fiber drive LED or vice versa? The fiber was put in this building in 1985, but the fiber was picked up on the building management side for me to utilize to drive the lights on the outside of this building. Interesting. And we only changed the color of this building and it will change colors tonight and everybody's gonna ask me why, I'll have to look it up on the website. Because <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember off the top of my head. Uh, but we generate about $640,000 a year just as an advertising piece uh -huh. for the charities. Because we only do it for charities. We don't do it because the sports team down the street wins or the one down that street wins. So you don't do it, it doesn't turn orange when UT wins. It's only for charities, and who's orange? Uh, <laughs> That's a Texas joke. Uh. So, did fiber change us? Yes, we decided to use fiber to drive that system, and then we have built on it from there. And you said Cree made a great light. What does that mean to you? So Cree, we're buying about 800 of those fixtures for the two garages we have. Uh, over the next 60 days, we'll be doing a lighting retrofit. And to be honest with you, I don't know how many garages you drive through, but if you'll look up at the fixture and look back down, the first thing you see is dots. <laughs> how many cars can back out in front of you before you clear your vision? The square Cree fixture 
does not do that. Interesting. So that was the seldom the ownership for me. They love everything round. Because it's not, to be honest with you, they love their light fixtures to be round because it doesn't have to be square with something. And it's not off when they walk through and look at it. They're a German ownership. Mm. But selling them that square fixture and they're buying off on it and then them looking at me going, nope, it's the wrong fixture. Let's get a round one. So we look for a round one for three months and then we send these fixtures to Houston where they were going to review them again and... One of the people from our asset team in Chicago walked through with them, and I, I wasn't there, and said, as soon as they walked up on it, the first thing they said, don't see dots, that's the one we got to go with. The dots are a lawsuit waiting to happen. You're driving through a garage at seven, even seven miles an hour, and somebody backs out in front of you. You look up for something and look down. And the Cree fixture as well yeah. has all the sensors to be shut off or be dimmed until you get to a certain point and they'll brighten back up. All that technology all, all is there. Automatically. Yep. Yeah, all all of that technology is there in those fixtures. Like, and, and any LED fixture. I'm just, the Cree fixture he brought up, yeah. Yeah. Got something it. that I'm purchasing. No, and Jeff, just to add real quick, you know, we're talking about LED. We've touched on, um, on wireless RF and, and, and how, um, and today we are, and, and the energy codes, they do impose added cost per square foot on an improvement. Um, however, you got to look at, at where the technology is now. That switch on the wall is a wireless switch, and it's communicating uh, with a wireless photocell. Uh, and it's dimming the LED fixtures. And um, so that pipe and that wire go away. Um, and, and so there are all these sort of, you know, interchangeables that, that you know, you're, you're adding cost here, but you're pulling it away here. And, um, you know, you, you hope that it's a net positive, of course, and, and with LED it will be. And coming back to the parking garage, and the, uh, how many fixtures are you putting in? Probably close to 800, 800. by the time we're done. Walk us through the, um, the actual installation of that, and I'm coming back to fiber. And now you're going to, how are you going to leverage, are you pulling fiber to support that? Are you pulling copper? What kind of infrastructure are you putting to fuel those lights? For the first installation, for the installation itself, no. In 2019, we want to go back to it and capture the electrical usage. So we will use fiber in order to, to have meters that communicate back to us because in the open garage where it's open on the sides, those lights will dim as the sun moves around the building. Mm -hmm. And in the corners where it's dark, those and in the center, those will stay bright all the time unless they get the right amount of sunlight during certain times of the day. So in 2019, we'll go back and use fiber to pick that information up with smart meters. Using the same conduit you're putting in for the uh, initial Correct. phase. Okay. We're going to do that ahead of time. What other technologies have you encountered or... Uh, are installing that are incrementally helping leverage that fiber infrastructure? Well, all of our uh, communication systems for the intercoms, for the elevators, for the parking garage, for our stairwells, uh, access card systems, we're going to RFI readers uh, in March of 2019. Who wants to carry a badge anymore? If I can just walk up and get within seven or eight feet, credentials are on my phone. Mm -hmm. Nobody leaves home without their phone right. most of the time. How do you run your homes? We talk about fiber. How do you run your homes? You can unlock and lock your doors, see your cameras, change your thermostats. It all starts in your home. You can't do that without fiber in the building. That fiber has to communicate back in some form or fashion in order to make this work. Tim, any incremental technologies that you've been able to justify because your fiber was already there? Um, well, you know, Jeff, the, the, our fiber, um, I mentioned earlier, it, it's, it's, it's a, a new element to the California Center now. Um, it, it's, there was piecemeal fiber, as I said earlier, in, in that, you know, tenant, um, you know, the tenant on the 27th floor needed a fiber run to come up and Cogent would be their provider. Um, so now it is... It's just to be clear, you had... Core riser systems. Right. But every tenant had pulled their own fiber. They pulled their own fiber. The building exactly. didn't have a 
structured consolidated fiber system they could use for these incremental systems. Exactly, okay. exactly. And so there's no longer any need for these little one-offs. Um, hey, just let's jump on our backbone. And um, it's in place. Um, I don't know if you, I guess at some point it will no longer be an, an amenity it uh, it will it'll be part and parcel and and you know it already is sort of but uh, you know uh, there uh, it's it's there and and so now just come on in and plug and play. Yeah. So here at Bank of America Plaza, the forethought for whoever thought to run as much fiber in this building as they did when it was being built. Kudos to them. Mm -hmm. That's Jimmy Charles. No. Right back there. No. <laughs> he can walk around and shake his hands all he wants. We'll see. He's got to have documentation to prove it. Uh, no, absolutely kudos to them. Who wants to live on the 70th floor where we are, are today and pull fiber from the ground level? When you can it, it, the, you, I mean, you just, the cost would be astronomical. And, and I, again, I used to run a shared tenant service business, 100 million square feet across the country, 100 Class A office buildings where we had the contract for the structured cable system in some of the biggest buildings in this country, Embarcadero Center, okay? mm -hmm. Mercantile Mark, Chicago, Rockefeller Absolutely. Center. Um, here in town, we had Thanksgiving Tower, we had the Xerox Center, we had Occidental Tower, Providence Tower, the Colonnade, all up the tollway. All those were our buildings. And if you've got to pull fiber and you go look at your core riser, and those conduits are full. <laughs> you have to x-ray the slab yep. to see where the rebar is in order to make a decision where you're going to drill next. Yeah. And if you miss it, and you, you know what I'm going to Cut electrical, say. cut anything that might you, dr you drill, and you pop a rebar, mm -hmm. you just ruin the structural integrity of a whole floor. That's why Jimmy's doing laps in the back because they put in 30 years ago a structured system here and they protected that riser so that no one could operate in that riser. Absolutely. Right? In, in 28 years in Dallas is how long I've spent in this industry. And there is not cleaner riser rooms than there are in this building. I have seen riser rooms that are absolutely a mess. Those photos those sh they showed. Spaghetti. That's not even justice to some of the stuff we've seen. Hanging in our ceilings as well as in our closets because it wasn't managed. I'd put I'd put my riser closets right up there with. Right, we're gonna see whose muscles bigger, you know. But, then, but we'll, we'll we'll test that after the end of the show. But, uh, I, have, I have a question because uh, because the old cabling and uh, you know there's uh, an issue as it gets older and it's abandoned. Is the law and I'm not maybe people here in the audience would know and yourself. The, is the law that you it can stay there? But once you move into retrofit or whatever, you have to pull it out. Is that? No. So in Dallas, okay. Dallas only requires you to take it out of the ceiling to the riser closet. Uh -huh. Because as long as it's in that ceiling, it is an issue for anybody that gets in that ceiling and has to look for something or may get caught on it. So as long as it goes back to the riser closet, it's good in Dallas. But, but Ron, you touched on this earlier, and, and it's, it's too true still today, that it, it, that isn't being enforced all the time. And so it really, it, the enforcement comes through, you know, building ownership and management, you know, as a cultural thing. Um, and, you know, you make it a standard um, uh, or construction rule and regulation, if you will. Um, but I have not seen inspectors come through and look that way. I mean, they can see it, but they're, they're not going to go there, it seems. Because right. I've heard horror stories where risers are full, so they'll you know, run it wherever they can, el in elevator shafts and in ventilation, which yep. is horrific when you think about it. Well, part of that is bad management. Yeah. 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 And so I don't know if that's On our part, true that is, if we it? were allowing that, we wouldn't be where we are today. Yeah. <laughs> This is, this is very true. So, we, we are out of time, and, uh, but I do want to say, are there any questions for the panelists here? And I, I, I do hope that getting the perspective from the automated system owners and engineers has been helpful, but do we have any questions, closing questions? Okay. Uh, what time does the bar close? <laughs> <laughs> it is 8.30, so maybe we get kudos for finishing on time, but uh, let's give a round of applause to these guys. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Really Appreciate good. it. Thank you. Yeah. And, uh
Special thanks to our headlining sponsors, Xdenet, Zenwave, and Solid.